go in our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 12 this morning. Proverbs chapter 12. This was actually one of the memory verses we had on our, our Wednesday night series. Been on, on my mind and, and heart, and I just thought we'd uh, take a look at it, the subject this morning. Proverbs 12.25 says, Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. What we're looking at this morning is, uh, uh, I used to hear the expression, what's the good word? You ever, you ever, I don't know, maybe that's old. I'm, what's the good word? Well, that's, that's what we're looking at this morning. You know, when we read something like this, what it made me think was, well, what's the good word? <laughs> what's the good word that people need to hear, that I need to hear? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of verses in Proverbs about our words. There's a lot of verses in the Bible about our words, uh, much more than we could hope to cover uh, this morning. One is Proverbs 25, 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. And what that's saying is, having the right words at the right time is a beautiful thing. Sometimes we experience the other. You know, a splat on the wall <laughs> kind of thing. Where we say it and we think, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. But the right words at the right time are beautiful. And it can be such a, such a blessing. Listen, words have meaning. Words are not just anonymous or impersonal. Words are very personal. They can help. They can hurt. As children, probably most of us used to say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Boy, that's not true. You learn that real quick. Words can hurt us. And uh, we need to be careful. Uh, everybody has a heart. You, you may not believe that about some people. <laughs> everybody has a heart. And heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. And I want to encourage us as people, as a church, to be encouragers. Amen. There's a place for rebuke, there's a, there's a time for correction, and, and, and so on. But we need to do it for the right reason. A good word maketh it glad. The, the trouble is, the world oftentimes has the wrong words to try and make us glad. Uh, there's a lot of people who they think if they heard these words, they'd be glad. You have won the lottery. But you know, research shows us that's quite often not true. And let me tell you, the, re the basic reason for it is the lottery is, is based on laziness and greed. It doesn't matter how much money you win. If you win $5 or $5 million, the basis of it is laziness and greed. And that's not a good basis for life. And many people, to their horror, have realized that winning a lot of money is, is more shame and more greed and more laziness. There was a man in Texas who won, uh, I found, I won't say hundreds, but many illustrations of people who really regretted winning the lottery. I'm not talking about the lottery this morning, but one man won $31 million. Within a year, he said, winning the lottery was the worst thing that ever happened to me. Within two years, he was dead by suicide. But what a tragedy. 31 million U.S. You know, money can't buy you happiness is certainly true. The, the world thinks, boy, if, and you hear people say it all the time, well, when I win the lottery, be careful what you wish for. The world sometimes will say things like, you can do anything, thinking that will encourage you. Listen, that's just not true. Sometimes the world will say, and we say it too, and, and I use this reservedly, but we'll say things like, it'll be all right. You'll be all right. And sometimes they're just empty words. They're not really words of encouragement. They're not, you know, when God says you'll be all right, he, he adds a because, for. We'll talk about that in a minute. Well, this verse, Proverbs uh, 12 verse 25. It has a negative and it has a positive. Heaviness. We all experience that. That's a normal part of life. Sorrow. Uh, Jesus experienced sorrow. Uh, there's no sin in sorrow. But it says that heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop. That means to be bowed down. And I'll tell you the thing I found interesting about this is that word 
in the Hebrew is mainly translated worship. You think about, you know, bowed down. And I don't know if this is the main message of this, this verse or not, but it's a good application. Be careful what you bow down to. Heaviness is going to make you bow down, but what are you going to bow down to? You know, if, if heaviness makes you worship, where do you worship? What's your focus? Are you going to worship your sorrow, or are you going to worship the Lord? There's a big difference, isn't there? Uh, David experienced this. Uh, I think we used this verse just, just the other day. Uh, Psalm 42, verse, verse 5. He wrote, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. See, we're going to bow down to something. Uh, we're going to be affected in our spirits. And when sorrow comes, folks, be sure you bow down to the Lord. Let the Lord meet you in your sorrow. Uh, Nehemiah learned, the joy of the Lord is my strength. <laughs> and he had plenty of sorrows. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 7, he says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Uh, listen, when you're down in the, the valley of, uh, of distress, distress, meet with the Lord. Uh, the positive is, he talks about the good word. That just means, just like you'd think of it, a pleasant word, an agreeable word, will make the heart glad. That word means, will rejoice. It'll bring rejoicing. Man, there are some wonderful studies you can do in God's word about rejoicing. Uh, one verse is uh, Psalm 40, verse 16 let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. That's where our heart needs to be. Uh, God has a, a purpose in life. Uh, in your sorrow, bow before the Lord. In your rejoicing, bow before the Lord. You know, praise the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always, he says. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, he says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I would encourage you to look to God for the good word. You know, he says, a good word uh, maketh it glad. Look to God for what that good word is. There's a, a verse in Psalm 119 where he says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word will guide us, not only as to where we should go, but as to to what we should say. One of the main things in life you need to learn is how to encourage yourself in the Lord. That's what I'm saying to you here. Learn to encourage yourself in the Lord. You're going to have sorrow. But don't bow down to your sorrow. Don't bow down to your trouble. Bow down to the Lord. You know, when it brings you down, say, Lord, I'm, I'm here to meet with you. And let Him lift you up. Not only do you need to learn how to encourage yourself, we need to learn how to encourage each other. There's, a, there's an old American song where it talks about the you know, home on the range where never is heard a discouraging word. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't in Queensland. And the skies are not cloudy all day. Uh, as Christians, we need to be careful that we're not discouragers. I mean, they, like I said, there's going to be times when we correct each other and so on. And we need to be free to do that. But... We need to be encouragers. We need to be people who, uh, who have a good word and uh, are helpful to each other. And I thought, well, rather than... We're not looking for formulas here. Okay, good word number one. You know, and, oh, I'll lay that on them. You know, that becomes, do you know what I mean by a platitude? You know, where you just say something and it ends up having no meaning. And we don't just want a formula. But what we want to do is, is see what's God's pattern for good words. Well, number one, I found is it needs to be true. <laughs> you know, sometimes we try and encourage each other with things that just aren't true. It'll be all right. No, it won't. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes something happens and it, there's no getting over it. It just happened, you know. Lots of things are going through my mind right now. Is things that happen. I'm not going to mention any of them. Uh, Proverbs 12, verse 19, the, lips, the lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Listen, you can lay a word on somebody, and if it's a lie, it's not going to last. Uh, Proverbs 12, verse 22, this was, again, 
uh, one of, I think it was, no, I'm sorry, it's one of my verses. Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. It, it doesn't help. It's, it's not a good word if, it, if it's not true. Well, one of the first things he, well, the first thing he mentions in Philippians when he talks about our thinking, he says, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, it needs to be true. Ephesians 4.15 says, speak the truth in love. You know, sometimes we say something and we say it so meanly and harshly and, and for the wrong reasons. We say, but it's the truth. Well, that still doesn't make it the right thing to say unless it's said with, with love. Sometimes you'll have to say a hard thing to a person, but it needs to be motivated by love, not by anger. You know, sometimes we hold back, we hold back in saying the truth until we're so angry we can't hold back anymore. And, and when the top of our head pops off, I mean, not literally, hopefully, uh, and boy, we let them have it, and, we, and we're so self-righteous, you know, they deserve that. Well, listen, it doesn't make it right, does it? Heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. We need to be thinking about God's instructions here. So number one, it's true. I won't take as much time on each of these, but uh, secondly, it needs to be timely and appropriate. Uh, Proverbs 15, verse 23 And like I said, you read through Proverbs, you'll find a lot of God's wisdom there about uh, your speech. Proverbs 15, 23, A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good is it? It needs to be timely and appropriate. I remember we were, we were taught at a marriage seminar to be careful when you say things to each other. And he, this particular man talked about the pit hour. You know, in the home, sometimes, you know, the kids are getting home from school, dad's getting home from work, mom's preparing the meal. He said, husbands, that's not a good time to discuss uh, something important with your wife. <laughs> All right? That's not the due season. That's not the right time. Uh, sometimes it's just not the right time to say something. Now, it's hard sometimes to know when it is. But it, it needs to be timely and it needs to be appropriate. Sometimes there's things that are not appropriate for you to say uh, to a person. Um, we just need to, to look to God for wisdom in that. In Proverbs 27 and verse 9, Proverbs 27 and verse 9, this is an interesting one. Ointment and perfume rejoice the heart. So doth the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. You've got to be careful with that word hearty. <laughs> you, can, you can offend people if you're too hearty. But uh, uh, our words need to be positive and, and wise. It's not just the abundance of words and how cheerfully they're said. Something needs to be said. If you don't have any counsel, sometimes it's better just to give them a hug and a smile than to, than to give them a, words that mean nothing. I remember my brother when his wife died. He said people with good intentions sometimes would say such hurtful things. Things that were so hard for him to, to not get angry at. Uh, and, and they had every good intention. But it wasn't wise, and it wasn't good counsel. In Proverbs 31 and, and verse 26, he talks about the, the godly woman, and he says, She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. I find it interesting that when he, he in Proverbs 1, he, he mentions that as well when he says, Hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. I think those two verses go together. Ladies, the law of kindness needs to be in your mouth. Now, it's not saying men don't need to be kind, but it's saying in the home, that especially needs to come from the mom. And uh, when we uh, are trying to give a good word, it needs to be kind. And, and then, as well, it needs to be practical. You know, the Bible talks about it's not enough just to say kind words to people. Let me read James uh, chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. He says, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled. Notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? It's not always enough just to say something, especially if you can help on, in a, on a physical way. Um, don't just talk. Be an encourager in not only what you say, but in what you do. 
In Romans, it talks about a, a woman who, it says she hath been a succorer of many. That's a, a strange word. It basically means she's been a mother to people. She's she showed them kindness. She's helped them. Uh, she's been a, a carer. Uh, we need to be more than just words. And the, the last one I'd share with you is 1 Corinthians 16, verse 18. Maybe this is more of an attitude in saying good words, but in, in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 18, he talks about different people, and he says, For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge ye them that are such. We need to be refreshers. We need to not be people who are sucking the life out of others, but who are refreshing them. Be careful what you say. And th there's some good examples in God's Word. The, the first one that came to my mind is in Genesis chapter 50. It's, it's Joseph. Do you remember Joseph in the, in the Old Testament? Very strange life. God really used him. If you remember the story, his brothers were going to kill him. And then one of the brothers said, no, let's just sell him. <laughs> and so they sold him into, into slavery. He went from slavery to prison. He went from prison to the palace. He became the prime minister of the most powerful nation of the world that, at that time, Egypt. <laughs> and God shows us later that was exactly what God was doing through his wicked brothers. Well, then he rescues his family, th these ones that sold him. <laughs> uh, he rescues them, brings them, and, and is you know, helping them. Well, when their father dies, the brothers get worried. Ooh, we sold him. Uh, we were going to kill him. He, he's powerful. He might kill us now. And so they were really worried, and uh, they came to him and said, oh, we'll be your servants. In uh, Genesis 50, verse 19, Joseph said unto them, fear not, for am I in the place of God? And he just said, I'm not God. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones, and he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. What a good example of good words. You know, he had the opportunity uh, to hurt them. But that wasn't his heart. He wanted to bless them. And he did. Uh, that, that's a real good example of, of good words. A another good example, well, many examples in the scripture, are the words about God. People need to know about God. And the Bible is, of course, full of, of, of teaching about what God is like. For instance, uh, Psalm 145, verse 15. You can turn there if, if you'd like. As I, as I looked at this, you know, there's just thousands of examples. You know, I just picked a few. Psalm 145 and verse 15. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. It is speaking to God. Thou openest thine hand and satisfiest the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. It's just saying there, God is there and will help. Yeah, that's a good word. That's an encouragement to people. I mentioned earlier, uh, Hebrews, he says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. God's there and will help. People need to hear that good word. Uh, Psalm 31 and, and verse 7. I will be glad and rejoice in thy mer mercy, for thou hast considered my troubles, thou hast known my soul in adversities. God understands and shows mercy. That's a good word. We need to hear that. You know, in Lamentations, he said, it is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. They're new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Uh, that's a good word. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, he tells us that God is faithful. This is a great verse where he says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. That's a good word, isn't it? As you're going through temptation and trouble, God is faithful. We need to hear that. Uh, these are good words. 
These are words from God that will encourage our hearts. You know, oftentimes the Bible will say, fear not, but then it'll add a for, for I am with thee, or you know, whatever the, the next the words are. Uh, for instance, Isaiah uh, 41 and, and verse 10. Now you can see a key in this would be knowing what God has said. To be able to share a good word with someone, more important than our words, would be God's word. Isaiah 41.10, God is speaking. He says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Those are good words, aren't they? One of my favorites is, uh, it's repeated several times in the Gospels. Uh, one is in Mark chapter 6 and, and verse 50. It's when the disciples were out on the boat and Jesus comes to them walking on the water. It's hard to imagine how scary that might have been. <laughs> All of a sudden, here's a person walking towards them on the water. You don't see that. And uh, is it Jesus? Is it not Jesus? What is it? Uh, and the Bible says they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately Jesus talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Those are good words and uh, encouraging words. We need to learn how to encourage ourselves. We need to learn how to get good words from the Lord. And we also need to learn how to encourage others. Like the Bible says, heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. Right. Let, let me say this. Quit feeding on the bad words and the bad thoughts. It's easy to get into that habit. Beating yourself up or believing the, the, the lies that that people say. Believe the truth. That's number one. <laughs> that's what makes it a good word is when it's true. Uh, if, if someone says something about you that's a problem you have and it's true, listen, don't get angry at them. Deal with the truth. God can help you with that. If, God, if someone says something about you that's not true, hey, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's not true. And no matter how many times they say it, it won't make it true. And don't be beating yourself up with, with things. Quit feeding yourself uh, on the bad words. Uh, go to the good words. Go to what God has said. And let Him uh, touch your heart. And you know, as I, as I thought about this verse this week, the best good word in the Bible is the gospel. The gospel. Now, the gospel starts with bad news. Uh, some of you might get uh, the magazine Creation. Every time when they put out their magazine, they have this article. You probably can't see it. Here's good news for the world. That's in there every time. And it always starts with, the good news starts with the bad news. <laughs> and the reason we have the good news of the gospel is because of the bad news. We're all sinners. And we're all on our way to hell. I mean, that's what God says. You talk to people, they say, oh, I'm pretty good. Listen, God says there's none righteous. No, not one. That's the bad news. <laughs> all of sin. And folks, we see that all around us. We see it in our hearts. We see it in our families, in our communities, in nations dealing with each other. Listen, if everybody would do right, we wouldn't have to have a parliament. We wouldn't have to have policemen. We wouldn't have to lock our doors. I mean, really. The reason we have all these safeguards is because there's wickedness in our hearts. And you might, you know, we, we might point the finger at others, but listen, there's times when it's, when it's us that's the one doing the wrong. Uh, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. Uh, God is saying that we're all subject because of sin, and, and I'm quoting here from 2 Thessalonians, to everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Every one of us, we're subject to everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power. But there's good news. Christ has made a way for us to be free from sin and, and its punishment. God has done something about it. When he says the wages of sin is death, the verse doesn't stop there. Thank God for that. <laughs> but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That last phrase is so important. The world's religions ignore that. 
They say, yeah, you can get to heaven. Join our church. Pay money. Do good. Do penance. There have been different ways, hundreds of different ways. God says the only way is through Jesus Christ. Neither is there salvation in any other. The good news of the gospel hinges on a person. God who became man. Many people know John 3.16. I was about to look over here. We used to have it on the wall right there. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now one of the things you learn from that verse is that without Christ, we perish. That's what he's saying there. If you'll believe on the Lord, you will not perish, but you'll have everlasting life. Life. You see, God has done something about our sin problem. Uh, let me put it this way. Jesus Christ, the Creator, the Son of God, totally sinless, took on human nature to become our Redeemer. He suffered the penalty for our sin. And the penalty for our sin is death and separation from God. That's what the penalty for sin is. The wages of sin is death, separation from God. And to satisfy the righteous demand of his own holiness and justice, Jesus died for us. He was buried and he rose again. That's the gospel. When Paul explains the gospel in Corinthians, he says, here's the gospel. That Christ died according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Christ rose again conquering sin and death. That's the best news. And if we're going to have uh, good words, you know, we started by asking, what's the good word? Well, the good, is, the good word is, Jesus saves. <laughs> you know, we, we sing about shouting it out. We, we very rarely do. <laughs> In a crowd sometime when you've got nothing else to do, just try that. You know? Jesus saves. <laughs> See what happens. They'll probably get kicked out. I don't know. But that's the good word. And, and you know, no matter what happens to us, if you're saved, listen, that should keep you from having to bow down to the, to the, and worship at the throne of sorrow. You can worship at God's throne. No matter how bad it gets in this world, Jesus saves. And if you're saved, you're on your way to heaven. What a blessing. And we're only going to understand this as good news when we first of all realize the bad news, that we're lost and need to be saved. Let me read more there from John 3. We're so familiar with John 3.16. The next verse says, John 3.17, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned. Listen to this now. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's so important for us to understand Until we trust Christ, we're condemned. See, Jesus didn't have to come to condemn us because we already were. Sin, our own sin condemns us. You know, a person might say, well, I've been good. Well, God says, no. (laughs) He says, there's none good. You read through Romans chapter 3 sometimes. There's a couple portions of Scripture that I think are kind of disgusting. This is one of them. Because it describes us. And he just talks about how there's none that understands. We're all out of the way. Uh, Our mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. And he says down at the, toward the end of Romans 3, he says, he gave the law that every mouth might be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. The law doesn't commend us. It says, you're a sinner. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God without law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and prophets. God sent his son to fulfill the law, to be our redeemer, uh, to be our savior. Uh, We were condemned. But the good news is, the good word is, God showed his love toward us. He commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The next verse says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Saved from wrath. You know, John 3 used the word perish. Romans 5.9 uses the word wrath. By Jesus Christ, we're saved from wrath. Saved is a good word. We need to use it a lot. 
Um, you, you know, we use all kinds of kind of generic ways to talk about being a Christian. But a good Bible word is the word saved. People need to understand, without Christ, we're on our way to hell. And when you trust Christ, you're saved from hell. You're saved from the consequences of your own sin. Saved. Let me ask you, are you saved? Like he says here, are you saved from wrath? Hebrews says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And it's true. The choice is, is ours. Again, John chapter 3, the last verse of John 3 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's the good word. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So there's the choice. Eternal life or eternal wrath. And you choose wrath by not choosing life. You know, some people think, oh, I won't choose. Well, you choose wrath then. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, a good word makes it glad. You know, we live in a, a sad world, really. Uh, sickness, trouble. Lots of people are taking their own lives. Uh, there's a lot of people who are stooped down and are just, they're facing the dirt. Listen, God can lift them up. Jesus will lift them up. Jesus will lift you up today. There's a good word. Jesus saves. And no matter what happens, however many years you have, if you know Christ, you know you're on your way to heaven. And you'll not only be with Jesus, but you'll be like him. Let me encourage you this morning. Accept God's good news yourself. And the Bible says you can know. He says he's written these things that you may know that you have eternal life. And then share that good, good news with others. That good word. There's a lot of sad people around. Sometimes it comes out in anger. Sometimes it comes out in disdain. It comes out a lot of different ways. But without Christ, listen, uh, these are people that are sad. And uh, we're the people of the Lord if we know Christ. Uh, we should have a heart that's... Uh, the joy of the Lord is, is part of it. That's part of the fruit of the Spirit. Share the good news with others. If someone were to ask you, what's the good word? Just keep it in the back of your mind to say, well, I'm saved from the wrath to come. How about you? <laughs> That's the good word. And if you've trusted Christ, it's true. If you've not trusted Christ, you can today. The Bible says now. That's the time you get saved, now. And uh, don't, don't put it off. Don't think, oh, I'll think about it. Uh, I'll wait. Uh, do it now. Today is the day of salvation. I want to encourage you this morning. Uh, let's be people who are encouragers. Now let's encourage each other as Christians. But let's also remember that to talk to people about salvation is to help them not to be sad, but to be glad. You'll never have someone who gets saved rebuke you for telling them about the Lord. People who don't get saved might. But when people get saved, they'll, they'll be glad. And they'll be glad you told them. Let's go to the, to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we're so grateful that you love us. Lord, that you've given us the good word, that your son is, is the living word, that you gave your son because of your love for us. And Father, you've given us the truth and you've protected it through these years in, as the Bible that we can read and know today just like uh, they could originally. And Father, we thank you that we can know the truth and the truth can make us free. Father, I pray if there are any here this morning who are not saved that your Holy Spirit would draw them to yourself. Help them to see that they need to be born again. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.